Well, we're in the third and final part of the series, Speak Easy. My name is Chris, and I just hope that this has been such a helpful series, even in the uneasy moments. I've, I hope that this series has breathed, breathed some life into you, even in the uneasy moments. I hope that this series has given you some great tools, even in the uneasy moments. I hope that this series has well, shown a kind of a, a, a spotlight on the areas that well, you just need to work on even in the uneasy moments, because it's in the uneasy moments. If, if we just lean into those, if we lean into the tension, God wants to get our attention, and he wants to, well, he wants to mold us and shape us into his image. And what we say is how we started this series. What we say matters. The words we choose and the words we well, decide not to use the words that we leverage and the words we keep back, right? Our words have such powerful impact on well, those connected to us. But it's not just what we say. It's how we say it matters most. Why? Because people are looking at our body language. People are making eye contact with us. People are listening, not just for the words we say, but how we are positioning those words. And that's why the how is so important that we need to pay attention to. Now, in part two and today in part three, uh, we're looking at what I've simply labeled the destructive four. These are the four, well, kind of areas of our speech, how we talk that that create the most destruction. destruction. In part one, we looked at what James said about the destructive nature of our tongue, of our speech, of our words, how we leverage speech to well, breathe life into people or, if we're not careful, right, actually destroy relationships. And we've all been on both sides of that, haven't we? Words spoken to us that have encouraged us and given us life and on the other side, Words that have spoken to us that have literally destroyed relationships. And we've done both as well, haven't we? So in part two, we looked at the first two of the destructive four. We looked at complaining and how complaining not only impacts our physical body, it actually impacts those listening to us. That's the devastating, destructive nature of complaining. It actually uh, impacts those sharing that complaint and those listening to the the complaint is called neural mirroring and there's an upside of neural mirroring is where we have empathy and we actually feel for each other but the flip side the flip side especially when it comes to complaining starts to impact people and in fact it shrinks the hippocampus and jesus simply and directly said stop grumbling or stop complaining he just made it that clear it's like just don't don't do it. Like there's no good that comes out of complaining. He said, so, so don't. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, put it succinctly as well. He, goes, he said, do everything without grumbling. Do everything without complaining. Why? Again, what good comes from complaining? How can we solve anything when it comes to complaining? The answer is simply nothing. Nothing good comes from complaining. Nothing can be solved from complaining. Then we looked at the second of the, the four destructive four, and that's lying. And uh, we didn't uh, spend any time on the macro lies, the big lies, but we really focused in on the, the micro lies, those, those statements where we position words and position phrases, those statements that will help us, um, will help our self-preservations to preserve ourselves and using when we focus on ourselves, right? We start to push other people down. That leads to positioning. And we use our words to, and, 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 and phrases to position ourselves and reposition other people. And when we, well, when we are in that micro lying type of sphere space, it actually polarizes relationships. It pushes people away. And it matters. What we say matters. Now, all of this uh, leads to numbers three and four as we close out this series. And so, well, let's just jump into number three. And number three is, 
is gossiping. And we're going to stay in the book of James uh, mostly today. And what's interesting, again, James just hits on all of this. And in James chapter 4, towards the end of this letter, he's going to hit on gossiping. Now, he's not going to say the word gossip, but it will make sense in a moment. This is what he writes. He goes, brothers and sisters, he's talking to you and me. He goes, do not And the word he chooses to use is the word slander. Now, slander is this compound Greek word. Uh, The Greek word is uh, kataleo. And it's two words that get shoved together. Um, The first uh, Greek word is kata or kata. And that word simply means down or against. The second Greek word is laleo. And that word means to talk or to speak. And so simply this Ancient Greek word means to speak against or to talk down. A more modern phrase that I'm hearing more and more is to punch down. It's not the physical punching down, right? It's using our words to punch down on someone. And and when you think about that word, you know, they they take this ancient Greek word and they try to find a, 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 you know, modern English word. And so they use slander. And slander is part of kataleo, but it's so much broader than that. It really is about using our words to speak against or talk down. And that's where it's just like, it's really at the essence, at the core of gossip, isn't it? Gossip is all about talking down, speaking down, punching down. Using our words to, to intentionally talk about someone who's not there. And usually when we're talking about someone who's not there, right, we're... we're We're tearing them apart. We're speaking against. We're talking down. We're punching down on them. And James is just bringing this to the surface. He he goes, don't slander. Don't cut a lay of one another. Anyone who speaks against, and that word against is is that same Greek word, cut a lay He goes, anyone who, who punches down, speaks down, talks against, a brother or sister, or, and he pulls in this word judges, or judges them, which usually, right, is happening when we gossip, when we're talking about someone who's not there. He goes, who judges them, speaks against the law. And remember, the law. Jesus summed up the entire law to love God, love each other. And that's not... Jesus is in position as number one and number two. He's like, love God, love each other. Those are equal in pursuit. The more you love God, the more you'll put that love into action to each other. And the more you put that love into action with each other, the more you'll understand the love of God for you, right? It's, it's not one and two. It is one action, love God and love each other. And that's, I mean, that takes all the law and sums it up into that one truth. He goes, he goes, brother and sister, or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. And then he goes on, he goes, and when you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but, but sitting in judgment on it. I mean, the gravity of that statement. But he's not done. He goes, there's only one lawgiver, that's God. There's only one judge, that's God. The one who's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, I think about this third of the destructive four, this third one, gossip. And uh, I have just a list of some random insights and maybe helpful insights when it comes to to gossip. You see, one of the the easiest ways to determine is this gossip or not is this. Um, Are you talking about the person or are you talking to the person, right? It's It's a very simple kind of litmus test, very simple kind of lens to look through, or if someone comes to you, right? Are they talking to the person, meaning the person is there? Actually, uh, we have a, a great model to handle conflict in relationships. You can find it in Matthew 18. 
It starts with going to the person. When there's conflict, when the gap is formed between two people, your first step always is to go to the person. And when you don't go to the person and you go to everyone else, I'm just telling you, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's gossip. Now, maybe you have heard someone in a conversation before, if you've encouraged them, like, have you gone to that person as they're talking about that person? You really know that answer. What is common for people to say is something like this. I would say it to them if they were here. Have you heard that said before? Have you ever said that? Again, this is like one of those like common response. If you're holding someone accountable to not gossip, and they're like, oh, I, if they were here, I would say it to them. And I, what I have discovered, it's just false. It just, it just doesn't happen. Because it's so easy to talk about people to everyone else and never go to the person and have a courageous, loving, gap-closing conversation and that's why going to the person I mean Jesus just laid it out it's like go first to the person that has hurt you that has sinned against you that has said something that has done something like just go there close the gap immediately something else I've discovered just in well in leadership and remember leadership just is about people interaction and what I've discovered is if someone is talking about everyone to you, then they're talking about you to everyone. This is just a true statement. Years ago, I was leading with someone, and all of a sudden, I, I thought what was a leadership, kind of mentorship, a relationship, all of a sudden, one day, I started to think to myself, wow, every time we get together, they're always talking about everyone else. And again, one of the things I've discovered over the years is people who are talking to me about everyone else will always talk about me to everyone else. And all of a sudden I realized, like, this isn't a mentorship, leadership conversation. This is, a, this is a gossip situation. And when I say every, I mean every time. That, that's, that's not an overstatement. Every time we got together, I was like, all of a sudden it was someone new. Someone new within the church. Someone new within the community. I'm like, oh, man. I know what's happening here. And what I knew is, well, they were talking about me to everyone else. And years later, guess what came out? Because it's always, it's always going to rise to the surface. It came out that this person was talking about me to everyone else. And I just want you to know, like, if you have one of those relationships that they're now talking to you about, you just got to stop it and recognize that you're <laughs> part of their gossip chain as well. Another insight that I think is so important, especially within the church, prayer does not require a name or details. I find out so many times in prayer circles that if it's not led very intentionally, if it's not led very courageously, if it's not on the, the, the top of people's minds and hearts. They, it can quickly go from prayer to gossip. It's a very thin line. And yes, there's power in praying for people by name. But we also have to recognize God knows who we're praying for. God does not need us to tell him a person's name. He knows. And in fact, God doesn't even need us to talk about the details. He knows. Now, there's times where that's acceptable and that's needed and that's powerful right but we always want to be very very cautious and cognizant that if we're not careful it's going to go from a good thing praying for people and then also now it's really about gossip talking about people and that line is so thin and that's why we just have to keep this in mind that all of us all of us right this is about a, the position of our heart can just be one click off and we go from something that's so godly and God honoring like prayer to something that well is really de destructive and all of this leads to my my perspective the, the most divisive action within the church is gossip I think it's the most divisive aspect of every relationship 
as we talk about people. And then we complain like that destructive force come in and then our micro lies come into our gossip. You, know, you start seeing how these things all start to interact together and in one conversation, all four of these can get connected together. Which leads to our fourth one, which is angering. Now, when I first wrote down angering, I literally thought I was well, making up a word. I, I wrote down angering because I wanted them all to well end in ing, and I'm like, and I knew that anger again is just very destructive when it comes to our our speech, our talk, our tongue, right? It's such a destructive nature. And so I wrote down angering, and I sat down with our creative team. I was kind of laying out where I thought we were going to go in this series, Speak Easy. In fact, we didn't even have the, the name yet. And I, I, I kind of revealed angering. I'm like, I'm not sure if this is a word. And someone's like, is it a word? I'm like, I don't think it is. And then we all looked it up, and we discovered angering is actually a word. Like, that's a real word. <laughs> and so it still makes me laugh because I was like, well, I thought I was just going to make up a word. But angering is our fourth of our destructive fourth. And, four. and again, we're going to stay in the, the book of James, and James is going to hit on this as well. Let's just go leap from chapter four back to chapter one, and this is what James writes. He goes, my dear brothers and sisters. Again, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. He goes, take note of this. He goes like, pay attention to this. Circle this, underline this, box this, like highlight it. Like don't lose sight of this. Like this is, this is important. He goes, everyone should be, you're an everyone. I'm an everyone. He goes, everyone should be quick to listen. Now, let's just be real for a moment. That is difficult, isn't it? We're quick to talk. We're ki uh, quick to respond. We're quick to reply. We're quick to talk over the other person. We're quick to hit send on that message, that text, that, that DM, right? We're quick to launch verbally. And James goes, whoa, time out. Be quick to listen. You think about it so that some 16,000 words we all say a day. Again, some more, some less, but the average, 16,000 words. We're really quick to talk, aren't we? We're really quick to respond, aren't we? We're really quick to verbally launch, aren't we? And he's like, whoa, time out. Be, be quick to listen. Let your first action be listen. And I would contend that it's not just listening to the person. That's definitely, definitely part of this. But it's also listening to God. As God is going, hey, control your tongue. Hey, hey, watch out. As God whispers into your spirit saying, hey, there's other stuff swirling around within you. It's going to impact what you say. Hey, hey, it, it, it's, a, it's a listening to the person and it's a listening to God the Spirit who well, lives and dwells within us. And then James writes, well, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And again, how difficult is that? I mean, have you ever been into one of those robust conversations, those robust dial dialogues, or just simply a screaming match? You're not listening to the other person. You're just formulating your own thoughts and just launching verbally right back at the person. I mean, that's the thing with arguments. You just stop listening to each other, and you just start talking on top and over and launching words. And at that point, like, no one is listening. No one is listening. And that's when he says, hey, hey, your first action is to listen. Then, then, if you choose to speak, take your time. Slow down before you just say those words. In fact, part one, we looked at James chapter three, and it's just a reminder of what he says. He goes, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's, it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And that's why James goes, just be slow. 
Be slow. Your first action is to listen and be slow to speak. Recognize. Recognize. You can't tame the tongue. What we can do, though, is we can slow it down. What we can do is recognize what we want to say and choose not to say. What we can do is slow down our reply and listen to God and say, hey, God, what I want to say. And God goes, yeah, I know you want to, but don't. Right? That's why the slowness of our reply is so critical, especially recognizing the destructive forces of our words. And then James writes, he goes, he goes, and slow to become angry. Slow. Right? Quick to listen. My first response, my go-to response, is a posture and position to listen to the other person and listen to what God is saying within us. And then slow. Slow in response. And slow in our anger. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he, he, he wrote some incredible insight, especially kind of wrapping around this idea of slow to anger. In fact, you might be thinking, uh, isn't anger a sin? Well, I would, I would say that the vast majority of our anger is sin, but it doesn't have to be. Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, he writes this. He goes, in your anger, right, do not sin. Which, which tells us there, there is this little sliver. And again, I would say it's a little sliver of anger that can be righteous anger. That our anger is for what makes God angry. Remember Solomon, like the things God hates, the God, things that God detests. And that's why Paul goes, hey, in your anger, in your godly, righteous anger, don't sin. And that's why slow to become angry, slow to, or quick to listen and slow to speak, right? This is going to help. This starts to build a framework. He goes on, Paul goes on and goes, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now this is an analogy and uh, I've heard people kind of take this a bit out of context. Some people take this so literally. Maybe you've heard this if, if you uh, are married, been married before. Maybe you've heard someone say, hey, in your marriage, don't go to, don't go to bed angry. I, I, I disagree with that insight. I just do. Again, I'm fine with people having a different perspective of this than me. I'm just telling you this is my perspective. And I hear people quote that verse attached to a marriage kind of insight to say, hey, see, the Bible says you don't go to bed angry. That's what the Bible says. But I don't think that is the literal uh, uh, meaning of that. I think this is an analogy to say, hey, there's urgency to closing the gap with a the person. There's urgency. Don't, don't just get angry at someone and then well, let it go because you're not going to let it go. It's going to simmer underneath the surface and bitterness is going to grow and and that chasm in your relationship is going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And the next time something hits, that anger is only going to intensify. What I think Paul is saying is like, hey, 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 apply urgency to closing the gap. Apply urgency for reconciliation to happen in the relationship. Apply urgency to forgiveness. Because what I've discovered in marriage is sometimes, sometimes, the best thing for an angry moment is a good night's sleep. Seriously. Have you noticed the, the number of arguments that start when you're tired and you're stressed? And you're not slow to speak. You're quick to speak. Where that self-control mechanism has just I don't know, disappeared. Why? Because you're tired. And yeah, that's an excuse, but it's also real. What my wife and I have discovered is this. Sometimes, most of the time, a good night's sleep, we wake up the next morning, we look at each other, and we're like, we were just being stupid yesterday. We are just, and it just goes away. Now, there's other times when we wake up and we still have to, we have to close the gap. The gap is still there. I'm just saying when you're tired, when you're stressed, and especially when those two things are together, sometimes a good night's sleep. 
but we, we don't let more than a day go by. It's kind of a 24-hour period. And sometimes just going to bed and waking up the next day solves 90% of it or all of it. Sometimes we still have to close the gap. Sometimes we still have to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes we still have to say, we, we need to work through that together. But that good night's sleep just makes that really big issue a bit smaller. And I think that's what Paul was getting at. It's like, hey, apply urgency. Apply urgency. Because if not, bitterness is going to grow. The chasm is going to grow bigger. Right? Distance is going to happen. And it's just going to build and grow and build and grow and cause more and more destruction. And then he ends by writing. He goes, and do not give the devil a foothold. I don't give the devil a foothold in you and in your relationship. Because remember, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's mastered it for thousands and thousands of years. And he wants to do that within you and within your relationships. To come in, to steal, to kill, and destroy. I'm just telling you, recognize that. That's why when there is a gap, you got to close it. And that's why James is like, hey, hey, be, be quick to listen. Again, listen to that person and listen to what God's saying to you. And be slow to speak. Be slow to reply. Be slow. And then he writes, because human anger, that sinful anger, not God-honoring righteous anger, but human anger, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Remember, righteousness is about being right before God, saying, hey, God, my eyes are locked on you, and I'm desiring to walk in your footsteps. I want my life to reflect you. That's why we talk about loving and living and leading like Jesus. That's our pursuit. Not, it's not about perfection, but our pursuit. Like we are pursuing a life that reflects Jesus how to love like him, how to live like him, how to lead like him. And James goes, therefore, therefore, get rid of, uh, that, that, that phrase can mean to stop, like literally stop. It can also mean, uh, it's this word image of taking off like uh, dirty soiled clothing, right? Taking off the uh, soiled cl clothing. So, so James is like, hey, stop, remove. Right? That's the image. Like, think about when Jesus was like, stop grumbling. It's that clear. It's that concise. Get rid of all moral filth. Complaining. Lying. Gossiping. Angering. And the evil that is so prevalent. Again, we looked at this. Part one, the tongue is also is a fire, a world of evil amongst the parts of the body. James is just pointing the spotlight on the destructive nature of our tongues. And humbly accept the word planted in you. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God. And you make your way through John chapter 1 and all senses and the Word became flesh. That Jesus himself is the Word, is the Logos. James is like, and the Word planted in you. That's what needs to grow. God's word in us. And that's why I love what James has written throughout this whole book, this whole letter. Because it's so practical. He's like, this is a practical living out of your faith in Jesus. And he goes, which can save you. Now, here's my one practical insight when it comes to angering. It's, it's super simple. Put your mouth in time out. It's that simple. If you uh, have young kids, if you've ever parented young kids, if 
you've ever been around young kids, right? There's just times where you just have to put the child, little Johnny, in timeout, right? To allow them to control their emotions, allow them to work through whatever is like swirling within them, right? Allow them to ah, take a breath. Here's what we all have to do. We all have to learn how to put our mouth in time out. Whether it's literally our mouth, the words we want to say, or it could be our fingers that are writing a reply that we want to hit send on. We just got to put ourselves in time out. Because something happens when we just take a step back. There's something that happens when all of a sudden we start thinking to ourselves, I know I want to reply that way. But I'm going to be quick to listen. I'm going to be slow to speak, slow to reply, slow to hit send on that message, slow to pick up the phone and call that person, tell them what we think. I'm just going to be slow. Why? Because I want to be slow to become angry. Because just maybe if I slow everything down enough, I won't have to get angry at all and well, that means there's a great chance I'm not going to even send in my anger, right? Just slow it all down. Gain perspective. Start listening more to what's being said and what's not being said. Listening more, trying to understand where the other person is and trying to understand what's going on within you. Put your mouth in time out. Just slow it all down. Slow it all down. Have an urgency. You want to close that gap? Absolutely. Follow the Apostle Paul's insight in Ephesians, right? You want to close that gap. But just slow it down. Listen to what God is saying to you. Recognize that your, your tongue is a force of evil. And start recognizing what's stirring within you. What's that darkness? Is it pride? Is it is it self-preservation? Is it positioning? What, what's within you? Look in the mirror and go, okay, there's something within me as well. What, what do you need to own? And then James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Do what it says. Let's live this out. So when we think about the destructive four, let's do what it says. Simple. Recognize that our words matter. And how we say what we say matters. And when we move through the rhythm of our day, leveraging our 16,000 words, wrap around everything you say and everything you choose not to say. What does love look like.